Welcome to The Elevator. This is a visual novel centered on a jaded detective. It's made by Cyanide T, and it is completely free, so I'll have a link in the description where you can check it out for yourself. Let's begin. Everybody's got some skeletons in their closet they don't want anybody else to know about. Me? I've got a warehouse full of them. When you work in a job where you get shoved into the dregs of society, where you become so desensitized to the sight of a dead body that you can even joke about it, life's pretty bleak. Even now, I can remember the look on that guy's face. It's been burned into my head like a brand. Please, he said. Even after he'd killed all those people, he was still expecting mercy in his last days. He couldn't see the angry, horrified looks on the faces of the people around him, had no concept of the fact that what he'd done was wrong. That was the first time in my life that I realized, first time it finally hit home, that there are people in the world like that, twisted psychos who think they're the heroes and everyone else is believing in the wrong god. I couldn't sleep for days after he was executed. Did I feel bad for him? I don't know. I don't think so. But nonetheless, sometimes I catch myself wondering if maybe he was right all along and I've just been strung along with everyone else. Pretty fucking morbid to be curious about a serial killer's god, huh? But in all my life, I've never felt as sure of myself as he always did. Since that case was my big achievement, the pinnacle of my career, it was the one memory the Force let me keep. Awfully nice of them, isn't it? Letting me relive that time over and over. The look on his face every time he talked to me, his eerie grin as he was being executed. I don't even remember why it matters anymore, just that it happened. Yeah, it definitely happened. Sometimes I almost forget. I have a warehouse full of skeletons, but they're all in locked boxes now, except for the one. And maybe it's better that way. Oh, you're still here? Yeah, what's the problem? Nothing, you just usually clock out and go home by now. I've got some stuff I still need to take care of. Crime never sleeps. <laughs> For the Jensen case? <sighs> I let out a sigh. The Jensen case is the big one that we've been hacking away at for the last two weeks. Missing boy. Possible kidnapping. But with no ransom message after weeks, we're skeptical. Still haven't made much progress on finding him. I feel like I'm missing a, a detail somewhere. Are you sure this is everything? I gesture at the computer screen, and it automatically opens a holographic array of all the information John's gathered so far. Dave, I've gone dumpster diving for some of that. If there's anything else, I sure as hell won't be able to find it. Damn. Sorry, I know it's not your fault. But it's hard answering the parents' phone calls every day and having to tell them we haven't found their boy yet. I know. Sorry. I hate these missing people cases more than anything. Seems like 80% of the time they just end with a dead body. Awfully optimistic of you. Yeah, well, give me something to be optimistic about. Don't stay here too long, Dave. Or the elevator girl will worry about you. I never run into her on my way out. You never know. One of these days she might catch on to your work schedule. Well, guess I'm heading out. Gotta catch the Skytram now, or I'll have to wait for the 8 o'clock one. Alright. See you tomorrow, John. Once he's gone, I sigh some more. This job never gets any easier. Years ago, I was in the city's volunteer militia. Ended up getting hired to work for the district police in the homicide department. It was rough work, but I enjoyed laying the minds of the victims' families to rest. I think. Honestly, I don't remember much about what went on back then. Once I started working for the district, I got a chip implanted in my brain to improve cognitive function. 
I developed a photographic memory and an almost perfect recall system. But at the ends of big cases, especially ones where district corruption was involved, I had most of my memories of the case wiped. It wasn't just me. It was corporate policy. All the detectives had it done. I didn't mind it too much back then. At times, I even thought it was great not to have to remember the bad things. I could just focus on the task at hand. Guess I should go too. I'm not getting anything else done in this office, that's for sure. Our office is on the 78th floor of this building, a rundown place on the far east side of town. Even the elevator is old technology. I have to wait ages for the elevator to reach me now since John just took it all the way to the ground floor. Hell, he might not even be there yet. But, forgetting the bad things. Yeah. I used to think nothing of it. All the blood, the killing, the torture, the rape. I could forget about those times and move on with a clear conscience. And then there was the case of the South Shore Killer. So called because his victims were all people whom he caught at the nearby stretch of beach. They were all tortured viciously, and then murdered for their trouble. By the time I caught him, he'd murdered 46 people there, that we knew about. There were many reasons to believe that he'd killed other people in other locations too, before he settled on the South Shore. But we could never implicate him for it, and he'd never confess. Avery McMillan. I'll never forget that bastard's name. Couldn't, even if I wanted to. We did end up finding that Jensen kid, thank God. He just wandered back out of nowhere, dazed, but without a scratch on him. John found him and brought him home, and that was that. I still can't believe that happened. You think he just ran away from home? Maybe. He says he doesn't remember anything that happened over the last few weeks, though. Yeah. I hope nothing happened to him. I told the parents they should have him checked out at the hospital. I doubt they will. It costs way too much in this district. Can't they just go to another district? Dave? Huh? Oh, sorry. Yeah. You should get some sleep. I don't even know why you showed up to work today. Not like we've got other cases to work on. Unless you really did show up just to see the elevator girl. The hell? I think you like her more than you're letting on. The elevator girl, huh? John thinks too much. I'm practically twice her age. Still, it's strange how she just became part of my life so easily. Without even trying. It all started a few months ago. No, I guess I have to go back further than that. 17 years ago, I became famous practically overnight after my team apprehended the South Shore Killer. Avery McMillan was the worst serial killer anyone had ever seen since the Green River Killers centuries back, so I shouldn't have been surprised. Still, I wasn't used to the attention, not by a long shot. Up to that point, I'd had most of the memories of my cases systematically wiped. I didn't care about taking credit for my deeds. I'm a born introvert and didn't get into that line of work for the fame. But the district wouldn't let me forget about this one. Everywhere I went, my face was rubbed in it. I'd done some shady things to catch McMillan. I had to. The man was a genius. A crazy son of a bitch, no doubt, but a genius. I barely caught him. And it sure as hell wasn't because he was getting messy like the public still believes to this day. I couldn't handle all the attention, the pressure. All I wanted was to do my job. Being called a hero because I'd banded with the Mafia to hunt one man down and ultimately kill him, it left a bad taste in my mouth. The higher-ups hated how I criticized them for their mistakes. 
I said to the press, maybe unwisely, that we could have solved the case sooner if certain members of the district council had been more cooperative. They had to shut me up, so I was promoted, kept away from serious cases, and expected to hobnob with the upper echelon. It wasn't me. I had to get out of there. So I left the district police force, and my best friend, Jonathan North, left with me. We moved ourselves into the east part of the district and bought some cheap space in an old building to use as our office. Our private detective agency. We'll take any case as long as it's something we believe in. Our place is just one little speck of idealism left in this lousy, fucked up district. Even though this building has more than 80 floors, most of them are empty. Most places nowadays are more high-tech and fancy. The skyscraper is a relic of a bygone age. But hey, the rent's dirt cheap, so I won't complain. There's a pharmaceuticals place with an office somewhere in the 40s, and some other research facility... somewhere. Well, I actually don't know much about who else is in the building. It's John's job to be on top of that sort of thing. It's not something I have to bother about, since it has nothing to do with my job. For years, I was perfectly fine not thinking about the other tenants and what they do here. That's what I thought. Until she started showing up. A young girl in her twenties. The prime of life. I was about that age back when I was still a starry-eyed recruit at the police force. It's pretty rare seeing someone this young working in this part of town. Most of us settle here because we can't go anywhere else. An intern? A temp? My mind came up with a quick explanation and settled for it. The girl didn't matter to me. That first day, I caught her glancing at me a few times. She didn't look nervous at all, maybe just a little curious. I don't exactly look like a researcher, which is what most of the people in this building do, so she was probably just caught off guard. But we didn't make any conversation at all during our time together and she quietly got off the elevator once it reached the 54th floor. So there's another office on floor 54. I muttered to myself when she was gone, but that was all. The only reason I even remember this brief, insignificant moment is because of the fact that I can't forget things once they're in my head. Not anymore. After that, I began to see her in the elevator every morning, rain or shine, Weekday or not, if I was in the elevator going to work, so was she. I can't think of a single time when she wasn't there with me after the first time. Even to this day. For the first several days, we didn't speak to each other at all. I guess either she's as much of an introvert as I am, or we just didn't have anything to say to each other. I could have made conversation if I really wanted to, but I didn't. So, I didn't. She's looking at me again, but what's with that face she's making? Excuse me. Yes? I was surprised she was talking to me. She had a nice voice, edged with concern though it was. Your shoulder. W what about it? There's blood seeping through your shirt. I can... Sm I can see it from here. Huh. What a sensitive girl she is. Sorry. Happens a lot in my line of work. Your line of work? I'm a detective. I had to apprehend a runaway last night and he gave me some trouble. A runaway? A criminal that tried to run? It wasn't anything that glamorous. A runaway cat. <laughs> I see. Sounds like you had a rough night. I've definitely had better. The strange tension that had always been there between us lifted after that. Oh, sorry, I'm Elena. Elena Cormack. I've seen you every day, but I've never introduced myself, huh? Sorry for being so forward. Don't worry about it. 
I'm not exactly the type to stand on ceremony. I'm David Carmichael. Good to meet you. So there's a detective agency on the 78th floor. I had no idea. Well, we're pretty quiet and we don't bother the other tenants here too much. Most people don't know about our agency unless they actively look for it. I see. Well, we have some time before this elevator reaches my floor, so... Why don't I take care of that, uh... wound of yours? There's no need to... Come on, don't stand on ceremony, Detective Carmichael. Fine. Kids these days. Elena pulled a small first aid kit from her jacket pocket while I rolled up my sleeve. She had the wound to taken care of in no time at all. So I take it you work for the pharmaceutical company here? Why would you think that? Why else would you have a first aid kit? Actually, I'm a secretary at a travel agency, the Pluma Agency. I carry around this first aid kit because it's company policy. Huh. Do people get injured enough at your office to warrant that? You'd be surprised how much trouble people can get themselves into with a paper cutter or a letter opener. That's... amazingly sad. I guess my saying that is like the pot calling the kettle black. The pot... huh? Damn. The age difference is showing. It's an old phrase. I was saying that I shouldn't make fun of them when I get this much damage from a cat. Oh, I see. Oh, this is my floor. It was nice talking to you, detective. So that's how it started. From then until now, a good seven months or so, the two of us have been, well, elevator buddies, I guess. Maybe buddies is taking it a little too far. Anyway, we don't always talk of a storm, but she's always there. She's a pretty girl, no doubt, but John's got it all wrong. Hell, I'm practically old enough to be her father. Some of the things I say are so old-fashioned that she doesn't even understand them. It's not exactly reassuring. These days, a lot of women are interested in a stable older man, you know. You should seize the chance to snag yourself a hot younger wife. You haven't even seen her yet. Uh, sure, but if she was unattractive, you wouldn't have brought her up at all, right? You think I'm that shallow? Aren't we all a little shallow? I sigh. John's got the idea that I need to settle down and find normal happiness. We're already at that age, he's always saying. Over the hill, middle-aged, past the prime of life. All the more reason a girl like Ellen would never be interested in an old-timer like me. Well, I'll think about it. Hopefully that's enough to shut him up. Macmillan staring down the barrel of my gun. I can see it in my mind clear as a day if I close my eyes. I could have shot him from a distance, but I just wanted for him to get a taste of what it was like for his victims to be face to face with death. Would he tremble? Would he be just as afraid as they were? In the end, I think he felt nothing at all. He stared at me impassively with those bottomless green eyes of his, and just smiled. This wasn't the reaction I'd wanted. I roared at him to surrender, to tell me why he'd killed all those people. I'd been chasing this bastard for what seemed like forever. I needed closure. I needed answers. Killed? He looked offended at my choice of words. I was just returning them to God. God doesn't need you doing him favors, I said back to him. I was disturbed by how peaceful he seemed even as I held his life in the palm of my hand. Your God and mine are not the same. And there was that smile again, completely without malice. He really believed what he was saying, and he saw nothing wrong with his logic. Well, of course he didn't. If he did, he wouldn't have committed those crimes. I had nothing to say to him. 
I just wanted him to admit that what he did was wrong, to feel some shame, or to even be upset that he was being taken in. He did none of those things. The only time he showed any emotion at all was when his family got involved during the trial. I'd like for my children to be protected. I think some might give them a hard time because of all this. He looks troubled. Was this an admission of guilt over his actions? He clearly understood that his family could get lynched for what he'd done, at least. So I asked him, It's certainly not my fault that this is happening to them. McMillan seemed disgusted that I'd even imply it. It's not my fault nobody else understands our god. Our god, he said. But his family denied it. Their official statement claimed that they had no knowledge of his actions and did not condone any of what he did. They abandoned him, even as he was worrying about how the public might crucify them. I can still remember his youngest child staring at me when I was on the stand, but her face was unreadable. She probably wasn't old enough to understand any of what was going on. God, why did her father have to put her in this position? I wondered if she would have to change her name or move. And then I felt annoyed that we had to protect his family at all, to follow his wishes, even though he'd ignored the wishes of at least 50 people who didn't deserve to die. I am returning to Ashura. Those were his last words. They brought me no comfort at all. Another morning, another 20 minute ride up the elevator. I'd heard that this is slow even by ancient relic standards, but I have nothing to base it on and it's not like we have any mechanics who will fix something like this up. 20 minutes is just enough time for me to collect my thoughts. Or let my mind wander back to the past and what I remember of it. Usually it's the second one. Ellen is here again? Of course she is. She looks like she's deep in thought. Oh, I can... I, I didn't know I actually had any uh, choices to make in this story. Um, hmm. Well, if she's deep in thought, I kind of don't want to interrupt her, but... At the same time, I can't help but be curious. Uh, let's say hi. Good morning. Oh, good morning, detective. Sorry, I was lost in my thoughts. I could tell. Got a problem at work? You seem a little more tired than usual. Huh? Tired? How do you figure? I point at her shoulders. Your shoulders are sagging. Normally your posture is beyond reproach. I'm amazed you noticed something like that. I suppose that's what being a detective is all about, though. I bet you can tell all sorts of things about a person just by looking at them. These days, not so much. I'm just getting used to you. <laughs> there you go, being modest again. Elena and I make a bit of small talk before we reach her floor and she says goodbye. Work is pretty slow these days, but I can't complain. It just means people aren't getting in trouble as much this week. The less dead bodies me and John have to find, the better. So how was she today? He really is pretty nosy. Especially when there's nothing else for him to do but bother me about my non-existent love life. She was fine, seems a little tired. You notice something like that? It was pretty obvious is what I say, but maybe I am too conscious of her. Well, when it's just two people in a little elevator day after day, you can't help but notice each other, I guess. Anyway, jokes aside, I got some disturbing news today. Pretty nasty stuff. What is it? The Jensen kid we found last week. He's dead. What? What the hell happened? He was killed. On the south shore. 
My blood runs cold when I hear those last two words. The South Shore. Avery McMillan. I put the thoughts out of my head. McMillan's dead and plenty of people go to South Shore now. Accidents, even the occasional murder, uh, happen every day. I try to calm down before my paranoia affects my judgment. Are we being put on the case? No, the police are taking care of it. The parents just wanted to update us since we worked so hard on finding him. It seems they were there on a family outing. The boy disappeared from their sight for a few minutes, and then he was found washed up on the shore. Dead. God, you'd think they would have kept a better eye on him after he'd vanished the first time. It's not their fault. N no one expects these things to happen. Yeah. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, Dave. Don't blame yourself, it's just a tragedy. I hope the police can catch him. They've never done half as well in homicide cases since you left. But yeah, I hope so too. Hell, what is the world coming to? Okay, before I continue, I just want to talk about something that just came to mind. Okay, so there's this missing boy who then returned and then ended up dead at the South Shore. And we know that Avery McMillan was the South Shore killer, correct? And that whole thing happened, what, about 15, 17 years ago, something like that? I'm thinking, is it possible that there's a connection between the the South Shore killing that just happened, and the woman in the elevator? Because he mentioned that he saw Avery's daughter when he was in the courtroom. He saw her and that she was too young to really understand what was happening. And he wondered if she'd have to change her name and all of that stuff. Well, she's a woman in her early 20s, right? And this was about 17 years ago when he was in that courtroom, looking at her. So, if she was fairly young then, about 17 years have passed now, she could easily be in her early 20s. And with a changed name. Would he even be able to recognize her? If she, It depends how young she was. But it's quite possible he wouldn't be able to recognize her and that her name has changed from what it was before. Is that her? Is it very suspicious? Anyway, let's continue. The next morning, I'm waiting in the lobby for the elevator to come down to the first floor. The Jensen case floats to the forefront of my mind, and I sigh. Had some more trouble with a cat? Elena. I hear the click-clack of her high heels against the tile floor as she walks up to me and stands at my side. I sigh again. I wish it was as simple as that. The two of us step into the elevator together, press the buttons for our respective floors, and settle in as usual. What is it? Well, I feel like I shouldn't ask what you're so upset about, but I do want to know. Why do you feel like you can't ask? Don't detectives have some sort of confidentiality agreement with their clients? It wouldn't do for me to pry. Oh, I see. That's actually a pretty legitimate concern. Ellen is a lot more thoughtful than I give her credit for. Actually, this time I'm worried about something the whole district knows about. That murder that happened on the South Shore yesterday. Oh, that. I heard about it too. What an unfortunate incident. His family must feel awful. No doubt. And after they'd just been reunited, too. Reunited? Shit. The boy's disappearance wasn't public knowledge. Oh, me and my big mouth. I'm never this careless. Not usually. Something about this girl just lowers my guard. It must be those big, innocent eyes 
and how she's so easy for even an old man like me to talk to. I really shouldn't tell her those sorts of details, although I kind of already did. Uh... No, those details weren't made public. I'm gonna try to cover up, although, you know, she's probably gonna see past it. But... I'll try. Oh, I mean, it was the first time in a while that the family had gone to the beach, right? That's what I heard. Oh, that's so sad. Imagine someone you love being killed while you're out relaxing together. There's sort of an awkward tension after that, so neither of us say anything more to each other before we part ways. So how was the elevator girl today? You seem awfully concerned about her, John. As usual, I suppose. <laughs> you think so? It's just that I never see you interact much with anyone but me. So I guess I'm just happy that you're widening your horizons a bit. Making small talk with someone on an elevator is considered widening your horizons these days? Eh, I'll take what I can get. Is there any news on the Jensen case? Nope. It's only been 24 hours after all. I see. When John doesn't say anything, I look up and am surprised to see him look so worried. This guy is normally the balancing act to my infinite pessimism after all. What's the matter with you? I've been thinking. Maybe you shouldn't worry so much about this case. Huh? What do you mean by that? It's got some parallels to the South Shore Killer case, right? You were really out of it back then, before and after McMillan was caught. I think it's best if you keep your mind off all this. You dwell on that case too much as it is. I, I don't dwell on it. Are you kidding me? You think about it every day. Don't try to lie to me, Dave. I know you better than anyone. Who was your partner on that case? I hate to admit it, but John's right. I do think about the Macmillan case a lot. But can you blame me? It's not as if I have many other memories to think about. The Force took them away from me for better, or for worse. And what's wrong with thinking about it? It's unhealthy, that's what. It's been almost 20 years since he was executed. He's not here anymore. The killing stopped. So why are you still acting like he might pop out from around the corner at any given moment? That's not what I worry about. That's not it at all. But how do I explain my thoughts to John? I don't even understand it myself. Ashura. In an ancient language, it meant whole heaven. Ashura slaved Tiamat, the embodiment of chaos, and created the world of man. He's usually shown as being a warrior and representing the sun. The god Avery McMillan believed in wasn't some satanic war god or anything like that, but a god that apparently created the world. Not many people believe in any god anymore. While science hasn't exactly disproved the existence of one just yet, people nowadays are more concerned with the here and now than the hereafter. Even while on the stand at his own murder trial, McMillan preached about his god. For whatever reason, he truly believed that what he was doing was right. He tortured people when they couldn't accept his truth. He killed them once they did, because then they'd be reunited with Ashura. I wonder if his victims died peacefully, accepting a god that only existed in the mind of a delusional murderer. The thought makes me want to throw up. Why do I always think about the South Shore Killer case? I caught the guy. Tests and examinations show that he was definitely not in his right mind. Good triumphed over. Not evil, exactly, but the killing of innocents, at least. McMillan did say that his victims were innocent. 
In fact, that was why they were chosen. To populate the kingdom of heaven with good souls. How he chose his victims, even now, is a mystery to me. Though he talked endlessly about Ashura and about his family, Macmillan never revealed specifics about his methods or about his victims. People begged him to reveal if he'd killed others, where he'd hidden the bodies that were never found. But he never did. My family, Detective Carmichael. You have to make sure that they're safe. I was in a cruel mood that day, so I simply said that I could make no guarantees. McMillan stared at me blankly for a few moments before grinning. Well, it's alright if you don't. Though you will have points subtracted. It would have been nice for them to live a bit longer. But Ashura will decide when it's time for them to come to me. That was it. As much as I wanted him to know how guilty he was, as much as the families of the dead wanted him to suffer, he never did. He accepted his death almost happily, and when he was gone, there was no closure. Not for the victims' families. Definitely not for me. God. I think that's the problem. Catching him and watching him die did nothing to make me feel like my ideals held true. Even though he died, I don't feel like he paid for his crimes. And even now, I'm not at peace with the world or with myself, but he was. Does that mean I was wrong? But how could I be wrong? And yet, if I was right, why aren't I happy? Why don't I feel proud about what I did? Macmillan was insane, no doubt. But these nagging worries I have, little thorns in my chest, are a sort of madness too.